What should we be afraid of? That's what we're going to find out today in Luke 12. We start out with Luke 12 of many thousands of people gathering together. And it says trampling each other. And so Jesus said to his disciples, Beware the leavening of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that won't be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in privately shall be proclaimed from the housetops. Boy, I think we live in that age, too, where people think they say something private or they do something in a private moment and suddenly it's out there on the internet and everyone sees it. Everything's going to be revealed, it says. And the leaven of the Pharisees, like I said, I think the Pharisees were interesting because they were at least trying to follow the law, the prophets. They were hoping in heaven and being faithful to God. And they just went off course. This problem that he's saying with them, and we've seen this before, is so much the hypocrisy. It was that they were divorcing their wives for no reason at all. If she cooked a bad meal, a Pharisee would divorce his wife. That's, I guess, he was talking to the lawyers too. You are sitting there and giving yourself all the grace and all the ability to go to heaven, and yet you're denying it of everybody else by prosecuting them, but denying them the knowledge. That's the case with both the lawyers and the Pharisees, but essentially they were doing everything wrong while at the same time trying to be very proper and proclaim themselves as being holy, calling it leavening. That means it's like yeast. We talk about in Matthew the good yeast that makes the flour that grows into many hundreds of pieces of bread. But the truth of it comes out the other way, that this leavening of hypocrisy will get you to if you let it enter you. It tells people, don't be afraid of those things that can kill the body. I mean, this is going to be tough times coming up. Not only is the temple structure going to come down on Christians, on believers in God, but the Romans will. Romans are going to devastate Jerusalem in 70 AD. And not only that, it's not even just that time. It's all the wars we've had in the history of mankind. It's all the times that Christians have been persecuted, burned at the stake, all the horrible things that have happened in proclaiming the word of God. It's going to keep happening. It happens to this day. There have been Christians in Iraq who have been persecuted. This very ancient group of, I think they're called Yazidis, who were original ancient Christians are, I think, almost gone because either they had to flee their homeland in Iraq or be killed or be converted. This happens to this day, but he's saying, don't worry about who can kill the body. Worry about those who can kill the soul, who can cast you into hell. Fear him. But God, he cares about the sparrows that are sold for two pennies. God remembers every hair on your head. And you are more valuable than those sparrows he cares about. God cares for you. And in this term, it says that when you get thrown into the the fire, instead of letting you be a loved child of God, he says that you have to acknowledge Christ before men. Because he says, whoever does that will be acknowledged It says before the angels, but if you deny Christ, you'll be denied before the angels of God. If you speak a word against the Son of Man, it can be forgiven. We've heard this before, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. I suggested the last time, if you don't know what that is, go find out from your pastor. Then they bring you before the synagogues. You know, this is going to happen to you. You're going to be hauled before rulers and synagogues and authorities. This is going to happen to all the apostles. and. Don't worry about what you're going to say or how you're going to defend yourself. You know, you may think, I can't defend myself against the Sanhedrin or against the Roman court, but the Holy Spirit, he says, will teach you what you ought to say. Now, that might not mean you're going to retain your life, but God is going to give you the words and going to give you what it is you should be saying. I believe that. I think that God works in us when we are completely incapable of speech, when you are presented with something and you don't even know what to say, and suddenly that right thing comes out of your mouth. I think that's the Holy Spirit for sure. I have witnessed that one in my own life, and I believe it. 
he gives the parable of the rich fool. He says that someone in the crowd came to him and says, tell my brother to give me half of the inheritance. Because technically, I think the eldest son would have received the big inheritance. Maybe the younger son would have gotten something, but not what the eldest son got. And Jesus says to him, who made me a judge over you and your brother? You know, essentially, it's not my position to tell you what it is. Instead, be on your guard against covetedness. Covetedness is wanting what someone else has. And what you have is not what your life is for, is not what the purpose of your life is for. And they gave him a parable about the rich man who had everything he needed. And he thought, well, I have so much. Where am I going to put all these crops? I'm just so abundant in everything I have. And so he tore down his barn and built an even larger barn to store all his grain. He says, I'll say to my soul. So this guy's talking to his soul. Soul, you have all the things you need. You can eat, drink, and be merry. We've heard that before in phrases, right? And relax. God calls him a fool because it says that that night you're going to die. And all those things you prepared, you're not going to get to use any of them. Who one who lays up treasure in heaven for himself, your your life is about to be taken from you. You're never going to make use of all the things you prepared. And Jesus says, quote, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. It always, I think, gives people pause because are we supposed to be saving for our retirement? I mean, I, that has been a big focus in me trying to get a new job, trying to prepare myself for retirement someday, hoping I retire. Is that laying up treasure in heaven or is that being prudent? We understand, I think, at different levels. This commentator was talking about St. Francis of Assisi who gave away all his possessions. Is is that what God is seeking from us? Or is God just seeking for us to be generous and also prudent with our reserves? We always have to make sure that we're always looking to seek God first. It's not money that's the problem. It's not even your savings account that is the problem. It is about putting things, anything, before God. Because we're going to hear some other lessons here, too. He says, don't be anxious about anything. So here he just told him, you know, that (laughs) you're going to be hauled out before many people, but don't be afraid of those who can kill you. So don't be obsessed with death. Don't be obsessed with money. And now he's saying, don't be anxious about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. Because life is more than what you eat or what you wear. And look at birds, right? The ravens reap nor sow. They don't have storehouses. God takes care of them. How much more important is your life than the birds? And yet God takes care of them. And if you are anxious, this is always the one that people keep in mind when they're worried, this prayer. Jesus says, quote, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? You're not doing yourself any good. It's not like you're fixing the solution by being worried about it. If it's the small things that are getting to you, how much more worried are you going to be about the big things? Talks about the lily in the fields. God dresses them, cares for them. So don't worry about eating and drinking. Don't worry about seeking all these things out because your father knows what you need. So this is bringing it back, right? God the father is our father. And he knows what perfect gifts to give to his children, the perfect answers to pray. But if we're tied up in all these other things, if we're tied up in money, if we're tied up in embarrassment that we can't acknowledge God in front of other people, if we're being fearful of the people who can kill us, if we're worried about anything that is apart from God himself, and he's going to talk about more things too. We're not going after the right thing. God should be the first. And that's where he goes again and says, instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. You'll be given what you need to live. Fear not, little flock. Oh, isn't that sweet? For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, 
give to the needy, provide yourself with money bags that don't grow old because they're treasures in heaven that don't fail, where a thief approaches or moth destroys, where your treasure is, your heart will be there too. This is ESV. I think this is one of the most impactful ways of of living and looking at life, that we know that God cares for us, that we know God is our Father in heaven, and that in the end, it's the kingdom of God that matters the most. It is so hard to do any of this. And this is why he says it. People asked about the fact that Jesus talks about money sins and sexual sins so often. And the, why is that? Why are these the two topics? And because he knows those are the two things that if our heart is there in having these relationships that we shouldn't have, or if we store up in our heart money and put it in the number one place, replace God with money. And I don't even think it's even necessarily in an idolatrous way. If we sit there and think, oh, good, I have my retirement plan set. I have enough money to retire. Everything is going to be comfortable for me. I'm going to be good. Not worshiping money. I'm not even thinking of it as God or putting it in a place of God. But I am relying on it so much. Now my life is secure. Now my life is going to be happy. Now I'll be able to retire instead of realizing, no, you are going to have what you need because God is my father, not because of these preparations we put in the way, because moth can eat them, thieves can steal them. And, you know, I even watched like poor people in their tornadoes. The guy was talking about how he just finished building his perfect house and the tornado took it down. Not saying that's going to happen to any of us, but if we keep God in the proper position, God will be with me in this. Then we'll be ready for anything. And so this is the next passage where he says, dress for action. I like that. And keep the lamps burning, right? The light is going to glow. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so they can open the door when he comes and knocks. We're not going to be those people who, like I talked about before, when our parents would go away and we would just mess up the house and eat Doritos and do all these bad things. And then we would say, oh, parents are going to come home in a half hour. I'm going to go and clean up the house now. And then they end up coming home early and then you get in trouble. That's a bad analogy, but you know what I mean? If we are always prepared, if we're always the good servant, if we always keep the lamps burning and stay ready for action, we will always be prepared for whatever happens, whether it is Jesus coming back tomorrow, whether it is someone we have to tell Jesus about, we're ready for this. If we're ready for whatever comes our way, we're going to be that person that it talks about the second watch or the third watch. Those are the servants that are blessed, that have everything they need because they're ready and prepared to do action. And in this case, it says it compares it to a thief coming in the middle of the night. You don't know when the thief is going to come or when the house is going to be broken into. But he says that we should all be ready because the Son of Man is going to come at an hour you do not expect. Jesus doesn't know the time he's coming. That's the thing that God knows. Nobody knows when the Son of Man is coming again but we should be prepared all the time. And then Peter, I like Peter, says, why are you telling us all this? <laughs> like, what is the point of all this? I'm not getting it. And so then Jesus says, Luke calls him the Lord with a capital L, the faithful and wise manager who the master, it's going to be God, sets over his household. You know, Jesus is about to leave and go back to heaven. And he's putting these apostles in to start this church, to give the household, the the proper food at the proper time, and the servant who does that, who the master finds him doing that when he comes back, he'll set him over all the possessions because you have been given little, are going to be given more because you are trustworthy. But if that servant says, my master's delayed and then begins to like do horrible things like beat people, well, the master is not coming back for an extra day starts getting drunk, doing everything that's wrong, the master will come in and see what his person, his servant is doing in his house. 
wasn't ready, wasn't acting well, was treating people horribly, and watching him beat people who didn't deserve it. The whole point of this is that everyone, it says, who has been given much, much will be required. And for those who have been entrusted much, will demand even more. Your portion, your responsibilities are about you doing the right things. Jesus also told the parable in Matthew, I believe, of the talents, the one who had the 10 talents and invested it, the one who had the five talents and invested it. They were given a lot and they did a lot with it. But the one guy who was given one talent is going to lose that because he did not do what was expected. He was given little, he did nothing, and he's getting nothing. These are words, you know, like I said, not just for Peter, this is a word for all of us. We don't know when Jesus is coming back. We don't know. We should be doing at all times the thing that God asked us to do, to be responsible with gifts, to be responsible for the things that God has given to us, and to make sure that we are the servant who is prepared on watch and doing God's will all the time. It says that he came to cast fire on earth and that it would already be kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, very confusing wording. And how great is my distress until it is accomplished. I mean, these are kind of really big words here, but essentially saying, I'm going to bring fire and how it's distressful to me until this is accomplished. I think meaning his death and resurrection. He's not come here to bring peace. He has come to bring division because houses will be divided against each other and a father against son and sons against mothers. The whole thing is going to be against everyone. The reason for this is not because he wants division. He wants everyone to live in peace with each other, to forgive and to have mercy and for us to be a family and a community together. It's just the same thing where it talks about God hardening people's hearts. The sun will harden or it will soften, depending on what material you're made of. Jesus will harden and soften you, depending on what you're made of. And in this case, if there is division out there, if there's fighting in there, if there is going to be people against each other, it is going to be because they are against God. They're not against this person or that person. They're against Jesus. They are against the things that Jesus said. That's where the wars are. That's where the fighting are. Again, I came from a family that was Jewish. I came from a father who was atheist. Nobody liked my decisions about what I've decided to do in my faith. There is not one happy side there. This is a division. But I could do no else. Once you see the truth and once you see what I saw and have the Holy Spirit come into your heart like that. There is nothing you can do about it. I did not want this. I had no urge to become a Christian. I had no desire for religion at all. And suddenly I had a fight. There was no fighting, but you know what I mean? I had this animosity or this worry in my family I didn't ask for, and I, I, but I could do nothing else. I, w- I know that God wishes for ourselves that we would live together in harmony. And I think it's sad that we don't. But you have to realize that is going to be the place of the world, that we are going to be at ends, that people are going to be divided against us. And that is just the way it's going to be, unfortunately. Then he says to the crowd, this is the bigger crowd, not just his disciples, when you see the cloud riding in the West, you think, oh, It's going to rain. Shower's coming. We see the signs of what weather is and what it's going to be. Or if you see the wind blowing, you're saying, oh, it's going to be a scorching heat. You know, it's like the Santa Ana winds in California. When you're in the Middle East, that hot wind comes from that hot area and oh, just hot. But you know what? You hypocrites, you know how to interpret all the different things that are going off on the earth and the sky, but you don't even know what time it is. You don't know what's happening right now. You're not looking for the signs. And I think, again, that's where the Pharisees would have been great about this. They knew the prophets. They knew the prophecies, the forecasts. They could read the weather better than anybody else, but they didn't see what time it was right now. 
And the last part talks about settling debt. And again, this concept of sin is our debt and that we try to settle this. We try to get rid of it before a judge so we don't get thrown into prison. In this case, this prison is going to be death or hell. But he says, I tell you that you'll never get out until you've paid every last penny. But the point of what Jesus is doing, he is settling the debts. He is going to pay every penny. This is an allusion to the thing that's about to happen. But when he's talking to this crowd in general, not just his disciples, you know, he talks about the hypocrisy. He talks about not looking to see what time it is. We talked about the good servant who doesn't care about what time it is. He's always doing the right thing. He's always treating every well. He's making sure everyone's fed. He is doing the right thing. But those who try to play with time, they're messing up. And here in the say, you pay so much attention to the weather and you're not paying attention to what time it is. And I'm telling you, the time is coming where this is coming to an end. You don't want to be settling every penny. You want to have the forgiveness of debts from God. I think that's where we're getting. The price is going to be paid one way or the other. Okay, so that's a very tough end. I was thinking that he was talking because he was talking about the hypocrisy to the Pharisees in the crowd. And I'm sure there are Pharisees and lawyers. We've already heard that they were in the crowd and listening and trying to trap him. You know what? Hypocrisy is a human problem. We're all involved in being hypocrites one way or the other, where we try to do one thing and yet we do another and hope that our thing isn't so bad, but their thing is terrible. It's it's a common thing of mankind. That's what I'm going to meditate on this week is hypocrisy, making sure that I stay away from that. It is leavening that can corrupt a whole system because we want to make sure that we are filled with light, that we are not filled with anxiety, that we're not filled with caring about money and concerned about fear, any of these things that we have, but we want to fill ourselves up with God. And if we can get rid of the hypocrisy, this bad leavening out of our system, and honestly get rid of the fear, the desire for money, everything else, it's going to make our lives much richer and much closer to God's. The thing I'm going to pray about is that he gives me the strength to walk in life without fear. I think as many people, we take so much comfort, and I'm absolutely one of them, in having a savings account, of having a barn full of food, not just food, food, but metaphorical food that we have reserves in the weight so that we never have to worry. I'm going to pray for God to give me more strength against fear in life that I think at times only money can solve. And what I'm going to share with other people is the fact that God does care about you not having anxiety, about you not having woe, concern, fear about not having great storehouses full of things. He wants us to trust in him as the good father, to confess him before other people. These are the things he wants us to do and that we should be ready for whatever happens next. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can email me at any time at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear from you about how this Bible study is going or anything I could be doing that would be better or more beneficial to you. Thanks so much.